things I built before studio. I took a break for a while on that. So let's see. Creativity Inc. Like I said, one of the most frequently recommended books when people ask me um, what they should read or if they're like curious, not just to get started in like audiobooks, but uh, if somebody's interested in business, entertainment, and media, if they're like interested in any of those things, I think Creativity Book is a great one. And I think it's really interesting, especially if you follow it along with Disney War, which we did was that February or March? We did Disney War earlier this year. And the this book happens in the background of what's going on at Disney War. So, you know, the Disney stuff is happening over on the side. So you have some context as to the turmoil around Michael Eisner. And then it slowly approaches, you know, you've got Star Wars and Lucasfilm, and then you've got Toy Story. That's when they really partner up with Disney. And then um, I, I can't remember if it's in this book specifically. It, you know, it kind of blurs together where I get... All, all of the stuff, but the fact that Steve Jobs would not sell Pixar to Disney um, while Michael Eisner was there. I can't remember if that was a point in the Disney board book or if that was in Creativity Inc., but um, this just shows you some of the environment that Michael Eisner really created around the company and Disney. And then um, so fascinating. I just love hearing stories about um, the films that I'm really interested in, which is why I like Disney War. I liked hearing about The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and, and I know my, one of my favorite movies, Hercules, that all that stuff happened in the 90s. I love hearing the stories behind those and you get that in droves through Creativity Inc. So if you're interested at all in Toy Story or if you're interested in the short films that they did, that Pixar did to really build up the company or if you're interested in uh, you know, the Monsters, Inc. series or um, even Inside Out is is mentioned in there a few times. I love hearing the stories behind creating things. And I especially love in Creativity Inc., he gets into what some of the stories were before they became the films they were. And so I think that's a valuable insight that you get out of this book is understanding a little bit of the creative process and and just really getting a sense for how messy it can be with a company that makes it look so easy. I mean, Pixar films are executed at such a great level. The Good Dinosaur and Cars 2 aside, I mean, they were... They were good, but they weren't like exceedingly great, kind of like like Finding Nemo was so good. Or Inside Out remains one of the, to me, one of the greatest, like, I don't know. It was, it's, it's just very good. I don't have the, I'm always working on expanding my vocabulary um, in those ways. And so I really liked hearing about Inside Out in the early stages because I think this book came out either like right at the time that Inside Out came out. And so to, to have those insights, I think is really cool. So I'm just pulling up my uh, notes here. Um, so yeah, hearing the stories behind the big films that you know as Pixar films, I love hearing those. And I think it's useful to understand that process. I really like that it's very biographical. It's it's both biographical of Ed Catmull and also um, you know Pixar and the stories, but then he takes the things that he's learned in that process and applies them. He also gives points... He also gets into the things that he learned by running Pixar, presents the things, his beliefs in what he's learned. But then he says like, but it's not, you know, you don't have to really follow that. And so I really like that he says, you know, this is what I've learned. This is my hypothesis. And this is how you can take it one way or another. And so I think that's a very academic way that he approaches it. And I think I have a note about that um, on here as well as, as a, Oh, that's that's in my, some of my key takeaways, but uh, I'll get to that. So I think it's useful to read for anybody who, um, for anybody who is maybe not building something, but I think if you're involved in a company, um, you know, I think seeing how a person thinks of things at the very top of an organization, like Ed Catmull, he's the founder and president of Pixar. I think understanding the thought process behind initially building a company. And then making that transition into managing a company, I think, is worth understanding. Uh, and especially for a company like Pixar, I think that makes it even more relevant. You know, if you were to read, a, if I were to read about, um, you know, XYZ steel manufacturer and their story of founding, it wouldn't be nearly as interesting as the guys who created some of the films I grew up loving, like Toy Story. Um, Yes, your doc Mike. Mike's doctor recommended he watch Inside Out after your mother passed away, and uh, it's Inside Out to me is one of the most. It's very powerful. It's very potent. 
Um, such great subject matter presented in a way that's easily understandable. Um, and I think the way that it deals with memory, the way that it deals with feeling, I think is so intelligent, but then they also bring it, it's like, the, it's classic Pixar. It's applicable to a child. They have things they can watch and enjoy about the films. They can get, they relate to the characters and they have fun moments. But then if you watch it at an adult level, you just, you start to understand how, uh, how strongly Pixar can execute in story and character and narrative overall. And you know, pick inside out to me is more powerful than something like up, up. I think a controversial opinion is a great, the first 15 minutes are an incredible film. And then the rest of it is kind of odd. And you get to understand that in this book as to why that is, you know, the very first, um, the very first iteration of up was like, uh, this giant bird and the, there was an old man and then it shifted and formed into this story and it, but it happened along the way. And so you get some of the remnants based on that. Uh, it's a long guy. I did get a delivery. Uh, I did not get to open them yet, but I do want to try it tomorrow. I did just pick up a new brush. So I'm getting some of the uh, gear there. So good to see you salon guy. Um, I, I got a nice introduction to salon guy through Mike. So yeah, at the time sadness was, uh, was a favorite character up is is a great Pixar film. It's the greatest of all time. That's tough. I think the the especially the third act is tough. I think I don't know that Inside Out is better. Um, Toy Story three might be the greatest Pixar film of all time, um, but that's everybody has their own thing. Toy Story three to me is one of the films I absolutely cannot get through without getting very emotional. Um, and for now, for many reasons, because my son is obsessed with uh, Buzz and Woody too. But uh, that's good. I know. I listen up, up, and you know, Wally. I think Wally is extremely uh, uh, potent as well. So, so yeah. So I'm still getting into some of my high level thoughts. The other thing that I love about this book is that it weaves. And you know, personally, I've always been a fan, and I've followed um, you know Steve Jobs and Apple of things. But I love the way that this story weaves Steve Jobs and it gives you a different view into Steve Jobs than typical books do. So when you read Apple books or when you read Steve Jobs biographies, there's a very different type of Steve you understand from those. And this one, you get the, the point of view from Ed Catmull. And I love the story in the beginning where uh, Ed says, you know, what are we going to do if there, if we, if we can't agree on something or what do you, what do you, Steve, what do you do if somebody doesn't agree with you? And he says, well, I explain it until they understand it. And uh, that's like the perfect way that he really sums things up. But you really get to see how Steve was kind of this in the background, not puppeteer, but he was really in the background and guiding the company into what it ultimately became. And he was the one really around going public right around the time of Toy Story in order to play them up against or not play them up against Disney, but play them up as a company so that Disney would ultimately need to acquire them. And the move worked out great. I think Steve Steve's widow is now still the single largest individual shareholder of Disney stock or something along those lines just because of that move, because it was uh, a stock deal. And so I really like getting the insight into uh, some of the Steve Jobs stuff. And so uh, Creativity Inc., the high level takeaways. I think it's it's incredible to get the stories behind the films that you love. I think you get to learn from and uh, somebody from academia how to build and run a company, and then also you get some of these like very strong takeaways as to how a company could or should operate, especially when you're dealing with uh, creative people like you do at Pixar. I mean, if you ever see any of the, it's worth looking up images of the toy or not Toy Story, but the um, the animators employees offices at Pixar because they are able to do whatever they want and they can build tree houses. They can build uh, like shrines to star Wars or franchises and they just get free reign and, and they're creative people. So they build some incredible places. And so I built a big plane studio, I guess, you know, if somebody else had the free reign to build whatever they want. They would build uh, they build something pretty sweet there. So that's creativity. Inc. one of the, my favorite recommendations for people and it was one voted you guys voted as one of the big ones to uh to cover here so some of the key takeaways that we really liked and you guys can feel free to drop a few in uh, as we go here but i really liked the not discussion but i like the passages around ideas versus people so when you're building a company the exercise to think about is do you, would you want the greatest ideas in the world or the greatest people in the world to execute on certain ideas and i've saw i've this has come out in other books and you know you read this in other business books that um you know strategy um 
culture eats strategy for breakfast. So it's really about getting the smartest people together. And if you throw them at a problem, they will solve it versus trying to throw a bunch of random people at a great idea because then they can't really execute on that idea. And so in this book, he talks about having to choose between those two. And he says, you know, in the end, he would choose people every time over the great idea. And so um, that applies to like the team that's working on a movie. You know, if you want the greatest movie idea, then uh, that's not going to be as good as if you have a great team working on a good movie idea. And so I really like that. Um, key takeaways. I The other thing is that you really get a firsthand account on the way that, um, you know, Disney bought Pixar, but in a large way, the way that Pixar was acquired and the positions that Ed Catmull and John Lasseter took at Disney, it was really Pixar ifying Disney in this. And it's the exact same parallel that um, the Apple and next acquisition happened in the late nineties. So, um, you know, Ed Catmull and John Lasseter come in, they, they take over Disney creative and they start pumping out films now that are of Pixar's caliber. And so I think the very first one was princess and the frog, right? That was, they were still trying to do traditional cell animation and then that didn't do as well at the box office. So they shifted into what became tangled. Tangled was a huge, I think it was a big hit. It was a, it was a successful film, but then you started getting, um, frozen. I also love that in this book. You hear this book came out well before Frozen, but it was referred to as the Ice Queen or Ice Princess. And that idea started back in the early 2000s, and it is now one of the biggest animation films of all time. And so seeing that kind of go through the process and then becoming a film well after this book came out, I don't think they even have the name Frozen by the time uh, that the book was written. And, um, and so you have Frozen, you had Moana that came out last year. You definitely you had things like planes. Planes came out in that time too, so uh, hit or miss there. But the way that they went into the company, used the Pixar formula to really boost the Disney animation studios was really cool to see. The same way that when Apple acquired Next, Steve Jobs came in as the CEO, brought his Next team in there like Scott Forstall and um, I'm blanking on names, the father of the iPod, Tony Fidel, he brought in the next team and then they nextified Apple in a big way. And so interesting, those, you know, those aren't, aren't directly related. Steve Jobs was associated with both of them at the time. Uh, but you really can see in this book that Steve took a back seat, let the Pixar team do what they did. He understand they were, he understood that they were a smart team and that he, his expertise wasn't in the film and animation business, but he was able to offer some opinions as they went. And so I really liked seeing that. <laughs> Yeah, ideas versus people is definitely a, a huge theme in this. And so then, uh, so those are some of the details that I really liked um, within the book. I also liked seeing, um, I'm just looking at my my notes here uh, on the book. I forgot my uh, my iPad here, but I loved seeing the timeline of how animation really came into its own under what Ed Catmull was doing. You know, he mentions at one point in the book that he worked for 20 years to or you know, even 30 years to create Toy Story because he had this idea in the, the in 1971. He was starting the industry from scratch and he wanted to make a motion picture, a fil full length feature film and animation, which at the time in 1971, that would be, I don't even know what the equivalent uh, today would be. That'd be like saying, I want to drive across the country in a hovercraft right now. It's like that, it was very outlandish. It was, I think people saw that technically it could be done, but it was very far off. So in 1971, he was starting there, and it was in the it was in the phase where you had to be technical and you had to be uh, very uh, technically literate in order to create anything. You didn't have time for the artistry, and you see that now. Where early on, if you wanted to edit films digitally on a computer, you had to understand how to how to operate a computer in a big way. But now you can give a, an iPad to a child and they can run iMovie, shoot a shoot some video and create a video out of there. And so, um, you know, that process has now happened at the same time. It's, it's similar to with uh, vehicles. So, you know, when the very earliest cars or motorcycles came out, you had to understand you had to be, have a very deep knowledge of um, of engines, motors, mechanics in order to drive. But now you know you can buy an automatic, and uh, it's very easy to drive today. So, seeing that progression under Ed Catmull, uh, you know he he mentioned some of the first animated films they took or they made. It, he put sixty thousand 
minutes, man minutes into making the first hand animation, which is if you look it up on YouTube, it's just like very simple movement. And it looks like a college thesis, like a student film type of thing. And it took a lot. And then he was really at the forefront of anti-aliasing, which is huge in the uh, computer graphics world, uh, texture mapping, Z buffer, motion blur. And in this uh, book as well, he talks about the fact that in Pixar films or in animation, if a character is going to move, there's this very uh, even perceptible to, uh, to humans that people move, if you're gonna move to the left, the character actually moves slightly to the right first before moving left and understanding that and being able to code that is what helps make Pixar films look very realistic. And so um, I really liked the, I really liked some of the details, the technical details about that. And, um, and 1971, he graduated from high school. Yeah. The, uh, the selectric typewriter that's back when computers were entire rooms. That's the thing is that, that the hand motion animation that was on a computer that was like as big, that was like, 300 square foot you needed a big big ass room uh to even host it and cool it and it reminds me of um some of the early computers that they started to put at the end of mad men in those later seasons of mad men when they oh they got a computer and that was a huge deal so they could do their ad buys um so 19 so 1971 the 1974 he gets his phd he has the smith and i like the story too where he talks about they said who who else should we hire and he gave them a bunch of names because he was non-competitive coming from academia. And at the same time, uh, when they asked the other people who should hire, they said nobody. And so that ended up getting him the job at Lucasfilm, which changed his life because ultimately Lucasfilm led to um, you know the Pixar image computer, which then led to the animation, and then Disney. And I'm not sure what I'm not sure what I Catmull's up to doing now. That's what I should have looked up uh, as part of this, but. The other, the other thing I really like about this is it talks about John Lasseter doing the Brave Little Toaster. When I was growing up, the Brave Little Toaster, that was probably m one of my number one most rented VHSs when I was a kid. Some, sometimes I wonder with all the times I rented some of these VHSs, why we didn't just buy them. I think they were pretty expensive back then. Um, I, was, I was very little when the VHSs were a big thing. But um, so the Brave Little Toaster, I wouldn't say seminal film for myself, but still one that I can almost recite to this day. And I loved hearing... His progression too, where he got denied at Disney, he had to go to another studio, he was able to get it out, but then Brave Little Toaster earned John Lasseter the story chops to get into Lucasfilm. Um, 1984 is when they first tried to sell Pixar for 15 million, like Philips and GM, but all those, they were just trying to get the company for the talent. And um, you know, think about the, the, the way things would have changed if those had gone through, you'd never heard, you'd never heard of Pixar. And then the first meetings happened with Steve Jobs in 85. And then Steve found like he starts next right as that is happening. Um, I like the Steve Jobs negotiation story whenever you meet him. But that's really when Pixar is born is, is that late 80s. And then the big turning point, and you hear this everywhere. You hear, when, whenever you watch, um, you know, obviously in the Steven Spielberg documentary on HBO, which I recommend, really like that. Um, they they talk about how Jurassic Park was this like insane moment in the film industry when it really proved that computers could do motion graphics. And it's funny to watch it now because Jurassic Park in a lot of ways, the 1993 Jurassic Park looks better than some films that come out today with the most advanced technical CGI uh, just because they use a lot of practical effects. But I think there was so much care and um, and craft put into the motion graphics or the computer generated graphics of Jurassic Park that they it still looks incredible today and it definitely holds up it holds up better than any of the other Jurassic Park films I mean Jurassic Park 2 doesn't look great compared to those um, but then in 1993 Toy Story starts to really take shape and um, and so then the other you know some of the other things that happen along that line is you get Toy Story 2 the great story where they almost lost the entire film uh, they talk about the creative process behind Toy Story 3. And that was the smoothest um, the smoothest film that Pixar had ever, ever done. I think it's really interesting that um, he talks about the fact that they don't do sequels or they, you know, they don't do films as much for uh, commercial purposes. And while at the same time, as that book was coming out, they were finishing or developing Cars 3. 
And then Cars 3 was, you know, it's really about merchandise and that sort of thing. And I think it's just a funny juxtaposition that you have. Um, you have him talking about the fact that, you know, you don't go into things with commercial commercial endeavor. You don't go into think creative endeavors for commercial purposes. But Cars 3 is really about selling a lot of toy cars and things. And, you know, I'm not complaining. My son has tons of uh, tons of Lightning McQueens and that sort of thing. So, um Obviously, it's working because we got a lot of them, and I know a lot of young boys, for the most part, are really into those. But um, yeah, Creativity Inc. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really, uh, I really liked revisiting it. I think this might be the third time I listened to it through on Audible, and um, each time, you know, I find that as I'm making notes, sometimes I will make the same note again, and um, and it, I think that's funny that like, oh, past me really liked going or, you know, really like this note. And then now I'm doing it again. So, um, those were like hot wheels on the Instagram, Mike, those weren't, um, cars per se, but we have the hot wheels size cars, uh, hot wheel size lightning McQueen and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, we got lots of, uh, lots of those toys around, but, um, so the next book is going to be Neil Postman's amusing ourselves to death, which I mentioned in the email is one of like the, the pivotal books in the way that I think about media digestion in general. It's the reason that um, a lot of the way I structured my channel. Is so I do, I don't do a lot of content that is like need to see necessarily. I want to be very intent driven. So like if you want to know the best about something, my my videos will be there. But unlike other YouTube channels where they want you to subscribe so you can watch all their videos that's not really what I'm interested in. And a lot of that comes from this book. And so, um, it's very poignant as well. It was written, I believe in the mid eighties and it talks a little bit about the internet, but it really, it just discusses like media. And, um, I think there's a lot of references to news newspapers and television news, uh, while at the same time giving you some perspective on there. So, um, Neil Postman, I know is, uh, it's a, I've, I read it in, in 2014 and i remember making notes so many notes in, in this book more than any uh book that i've listened to where the vocabulary is it's it's such a elevated state that um you know i had to like make notes as to which words to look up and uh, and learn them so it's a it's a slightly challenging read but i think it's a fun challenging read so uh the email went out with uh, amazon links and so that one I'm going to try. I'm going to schedule that one at the end of June so I can kind of get back on track and in the rhythm here. Um, you know, January, February, March, April, May, five months into the into the book club. I really like you know just the fact that I had to sit down, translate some of my notes into uh, discussion points has been really helpful as I go through this. And so I hope you guys are enjoying the process as well because uh, you know a lot of these are books that I already have, and you know, the, the book that I want to do in July, I'm really excited about. I'm going to do that. That's like the summer. That That's like perfect summer time um, in the book that I really like to cover in there. So uh, yeah, I hope you guys like following along with the, with the book process. Um, if you want to see, so we get uh, 11 people left. So I'm going to switch. That's all I got. I don't want to keep this uh, going on too long, but if you want to see, I'll go downstairs and show you the the last step here of the studio. studio. Because I'm really excited to have this done. And if you have any questions, drop them in because I'm going to be dropping off here in a few minutes because I'm just being super efficient with what we got going on here. So we head downstairs. So yeah, so the upstairs is done. It's still a mess because a lot of the stuff that's going to be down here um, is still up there. But 